This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. This is why the Nkumbuma Pride is such a firm favorite. It's Kinky Tail. He just looks ready for a fight. This is still her territory. Mm. The Evoker boys are here to stay. Ooh. How insane was that? Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another installment of Safari Lives. It promises to be another epic, epic week. We've just had a big storm out here in Juma in South Africa, and, well, hopefully that's going to mean our cats are going to be out and about trying to kind of mark territory and looking for all kinds of things as they kind of walk around in the coolness of the afternoon. My name is Tristan. On camera, I've got Sebastian this afternoon, and we are coming to you from not only South Africa, but Kenya, and we encourage all of you to ask many, many questions. Remember that Safari Lives is a celebration and a catch-up of all of our characters that we've seen over the past week. And that means and we want to hear about all of your kind of questions that you have about our characters. Remember to try and keep it relevant to those that we are seeing and hopefully we'll be able to answer as many questions as possible. And you can send your questions to hashtag Safari Live or at FC on YouTube and we'll try, like I say, to get through a lot during the course of this afternoon. It promises to be a really epic, epic day. Now that we've had some rain, I'm hoping things are going to come alive. Now, I was saying that we are going to be focusing on our cat characters. It's been another absolute bumper week, and well, take a look at where our cats have been moving. The first rains of summer might have arrived at Juma this week, but they sure didn't put a dampener on the characters making regular appearances. As usual, the little chief Hosanna started the week in the center of Juma. He then moved south before heading northeast scent marking as he went. Meanwhile, Tingana made his way south deeper into Juma, with an unknown shy female in tow. After a couple of days of mating, they then returned back to the north. Tandi and Tlalamba made a welcome, albeit brief, appearance in the southeast and continued to head northeast back into Torchwood. The Nkuma Pride also arrived at Galago Pan, this time on the trail of a herd of buffalo. As darkness fell, they followed the buffalo further south. We finally got another glimpse of the Juma clan's newest additions, this time at the Aubrey's Road Den. Up in the north, the Mara was busy as the Paradise Pride were once again found close to the river. The Olololo Pride meanwhile moved further south down the escarpment, following the large herds of wildebeest. Wissiara surprised us down at Kuni Beach to round out a stellar week with our cat characters. Well, as you can see, it was a really busy week, not only here on Juma, but up in the Maasai Mara, with many of our characters making appearances, and it's shaping up to be a really kind of interesting year as we've kind of moved from, you know, Hosanna being the young male around to starting to show signs of kind of being, well, starting to sort of progress into dominance. So it'll be interesting to kind of see how everything plays out. But while we explore and see if we can help find Hosanna this afternoon, let's try and send you back up to Steve, who, well, should be out in the grassy plains of East Africa, hopefully looking for the prowling cats that are after the wildebeest herds. Come to the Mara Triangle. We are up here on the base of the Olololo escarpment with a very nice herd of wildebeest. One or two zebra in tow. My name is Steve. I'm joined on camera by Archie. And it is a very nice, well, apparently 21 degrees Celsius, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Although the weather's pulled in and it's windy and it's pretty miserable. But we have been with a pride of lions for the last few hours. And they were hunting this herd of wildebeest behind me. And now we've lost them somewhere there in the rocks. We've given them a lot of space. We moved around and we're trying to see if they're going to come out. But um, could it be awesome? There's a nice pride of five. One young male, two young females and two adults. And we spent some time with one of the younger females actually pulling off what was actually not a bad sort of stalk. She got pretty close and right at the last minute she blundered it by running a little bit too blatantly towards a herd of wildebeest that then, well, just all moved away and they're all looking very relaxed considering there's a hungry pride of lions somewhere in the grass here. 
busy lurking around doing whatever it is that they're doing. They might have even gone back to their slumber because we found them this afternoon due to some vulture activity. We found the remains of a wildebeest from either this morning or last night. So they are not actually that hungry, but they have been interested nonetheless with the abundance of general game out here on the open plains. And when the wind is blowing, it is always a nice time for lions to hunt. So a gentleman that spent a lot of time up here in the Mara, he's now down in Juma, Brent Leo Smith. Welcome, welcome to the Greater Kruger National Park. I thought I spotted something. I am looking for Hassana, our little chief. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I had to have dangerous Dave Eastall, the objectified dish on camera with me today. So we are searching for Hassan. He was seen in the middle of the day uh, around the main access road into Juma. And we think he might have moved a little bit further to the south. Now, of course, we've had quite a bit of rain throughout the day, which has obliterated his tracks. But Rex and Trista are giving me a hand. Hopefully, we will be able to find him. Remember, hashtag Safari Live if you want to get your questions through to us. Lulu is wondering, did the storm bring much water? Oh, Darby, rollers fighting. And, of course, now they stop. I was hoping they might do their characteristic roll. Let's have a look. He might roll as he flies. No. He's building a bit of height. Are we going to do a roll? There we go. No roll, just a landing. Oh dear. Uh, sorry, I got sidetracked by the lilac crested rollers. Um, it didn't actually bring much water at all. So just enough to sort of dampen the ground and, and, and wipe clear the tracks. So if we do find any tracks on top of the rain, they are going to be very fresh because it only stopped. Oh, is this the smelly warthog that Jamie had the other day? I think it is. Nice set of teeth on this guy. Now, if I remember correctly, this warthog was munched on by the Magen boys, those unfortunate mangy boys. Okay, well, speaking of Jamie, let's go see which of our favorite cat characters she's off to find. was planning on finding the Inkahumas. A very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to this episode of Safari Lives. My name is Jamie and I'm searching for the Inkahuma pride of lions who were right here when I left them this morning. Now as Tristan has told you we had a massive storm by you know dry season standards. We had a massive storm a few minutes ago and I think it's caused them to wander off and go off in search of shelter. So this morning we had eight Nkuhuma lionesses as well as one Mangeni male. And although this poor young male kept trying to edge closer and closer to a pride, he's not part of it. And the lionesses were not friendly. They were growling at him. They didn't really allow him to approach. I wonder got this feeling that they haven't gone far into the bush. I really feel as though they might be around here somewhere, but I just don't know where. Cats are cats. They don't necessarily enjoy the rain all that much, and they will seek out shelter underneath the bushes. I'm going to have a chat to some of the other guides, see if maybe they can give me some input as to where they might have moved off to. Let's go to Brent, whose cat has also wandered off into the wild. Still haven't managed to find that little chief, but there we go. Let's look, let's go try run over Tristan. So let's see, maybe they've got an update for me. Maybe they find some, found some tracks and uh, that's why they're heading in this direction. I didn't see any tracks up on Zoe's road. So I'm just going to go have a quick chat to Tristan. While I do that, we've had some wonderful moments with our little chief behaving quite interestingly earlier this week. Hassana has been displaying some worrying tendencies. It shows he is growing up. 
is starting to scent Mark vigorously. The question is, how long will Tingana tolerate this insolent behavior? As always, a member of the ever-present Juma clan paid the little chief a visit in hope that Hasana might have a free snack. Hasana stood his ground, and with no food around, the hyena moved off under the watchful eye of Hosanna. There you go. Our little chief with one of the Juma clan having a, a, a pesky look. Now, Tristan and, and Rex have not found any, any tracks uh, after the rain yet. So we're going to take a bit of a gamble. If Asada normally comes this way, he tends to like to head towards Treehouse Dam. So we're going to go check uh, Philemon's dip uh, down towards Treehouse Dam. If we get nothing there, we're going to work our way back to the northwest. Oh. I'm just listening. Left to you. Oh. To the north. Sounds like Tingana is still busy with his lady friend, but in the north, um, in Buffalo's Hook. Oh, look at that. So, very wet pregnant impala disappearing. Have you seen Hasana impala? No, you're not talking to me. Fine, be like that. Sandra is wondering what's happened to Tumba. I think the last I heard, he was seen to the southwest um, on Londolozi. That is the last I heard of Tumba. Uh, Tristan might actually have a better idea, uh, as he, he's, I haven't been in the sands for quite some time. And uh, me, hmm. Actually, yeah, I haven't seen Tumba in a long time. I haven't even heard of Tumba, but uh, last I heard he was down to the southwest. Let's have a quick look here. Yeah? This is uh, one of Hasana's favorite routes. But there's no tracks on top of the rain. Okay, well, it seems like us at Juma have a bit of catching up to do to find some cats. But fortunately, Steve is in the Mara following some lions. Well, I wouldn't want to be a wildebeest in this, these conditions. We um, were with the lions, followed them hunting, and then we moved back into the area and we completely lost them. And there they are, hiding in the long grass. There's three of them there. If I, oh, she just pulls out a little bit. You'll see there's a third one to the left. There's probably a fourth one. Where is it? There we go. There's a third one moving. And there's a fourth one somewhere there. Uh, we were with the pride earlier, the Aweeno pride, on the lioness. One of them was hunting. And um, there's a beautiful pride of two adults and three youngsters. The young male we followed, he ran all the way back. He suddenly, after the attempted wildebeest hunt, he ran all the way back. And we thought, well, something's going on. Why is he running? Uh, but then maybe he just got a furious look from one of the buffalo that were hanging down in the little the little mud wallow area and he decided, hang on, I'm not going to stick around. <laughs> and here we are. We found three females. Now sheltering a little bit from the wind. The wind does make everything uncomfortable. But quite amazing that those wildebeest that we were with just before, how relaxed they are after being chased in the mountain. Bubble Girl, what an interesting question. You want to know where animals go when it rains. Well, there's nowhere to go, Bubble Girl. Exactly where you see them now is exactly where they go. Sometimes the ruminants like wildebeest and giraffe and buffalo, they're like, oh, the rain's coming. They'll tuck themselves up and sit down on the ground so they can have a nice dry patch. But quite often they just stand there in the rain. There's nothing they can do. And lions, you'll see them get very miserable in very, very torrential downpour rain. Um, even baboons will just sit in a tree, just... They don't really have anywhere to go, unfortunately. Uh, so they'll just be exactly where they are. In the sunshine, uh, they'll move underneath trees. Um, but the likelihood of certain animals spending time under trees in these environments is tricky because lightning is a reality archer. And those animals that tend to move to the cover of trees in lightning storms, well, sizzle 
pop and they don't breed because being hit by a lightning bolt in a tree well invariably doesn't leave too much in the way of a living animal afterwards hello Rosalind well the black tuft on the back of the tail as well as the black on the back of the ears makes it easy for the youngsters or the pride themselves to follow them uh, we spent some time with the lions before and uh, as you look from behind that's all you can see really as they move through the tawny grass and when they're looking in a direction you can see there's no real interest now the ears are kind of moving backwards and forwards but when they look like you can see now looking in a specific direction the adults or the others in the, in the hunt can actually see the exact direction by the positioning of the ears that that animal is moving and then they know exactly what the animal is trying to hunt the same goes for the tail cubs can also follow the tail and when a lion is a about to charge they flick their tail up and that's a very obvious sign in the tawny br brown grass of an imminent movement of the adult lioness moving forward so on leopards leopards have also got the black behind the ear but then they've got that white tip on the tail which the cubs use to follow through the long grass and sometimes is so much they have to play with and bite it but that is a youngster and one of the young females on the right hand side probably a year and a half old and there is one of the adults I'm not sure which one is the mother there was another youngster in the pride a very pale lioness who unfortunately didn't make it we haven't seen her since last year late last year but we were quite certain that something was going to happen earlier that lioness did everything right she used the rocks to her advantage she really got close to a herd of unsuspecting wildebeest and well it was not to be Okay, well, we're going to stay here with these lions, and while we do that, let's go back down to Tristan. Okay, well, we're going to stay. There's a technical issue with Tristan and the Bushwalk team, so you're stuck with me for the moment. And there we go. You can see the coloration of the body. As they get older, lionesses start to sort of fade a little bit in the, in the coloration. And you can see the difference between those two in coloration. And one on the right is a little bit more sort of sort of brighter in color hasn't been washed as many times but that one in the middle is actually the young male now my word how confusing was that yeah he's joined back again he ran all the way away and he's back you can actually see he's just got the little bits of making of fur on the bottom of the neck and he is a pale in color probably his sister was the pale female that disappeared he is not the brightest he's been washed too many times but quite often you can tell a difference in age due to the coloration and this young boy he's got a very bad wound on his back hip Ali, there are a couple prides around with cubs. The Paradise Pride has got some cubs that are probably between the ages of six and eight months. Um, these are the youngest that this pride has got, and normally the, the, the cub interval is about two years or so. So there's still a few months away from new cubs being brought into the pride. And I haven't seen any males with this, with this pride. The lions, though, are all over the place at the moment. It's very hard to get a handle on who they are. Not far away, just, just over here, we've had the Olalola pride. We've had other males I haven't seen before. Or the sausage tree pride is a bit further down but they are moving because the food is just abundant so the cubs at the moment the sausage tree pride which is much further south they've got two very small little ones that I haven't yet seen and there's been a lot of mating going on in that pride in the last couple of weeks uh, but we haven't seen anything new in regards to that but um, um, back over to these beautiful lions of the long grass I would love to show you some cubs we have been searching for the sausage tree pride but we haven't yet had any luck but anyway while we watch these lions getting a little bit on the move let's go back down to bushwalk team that's got elephants on foot Steve so even though we're out on foot and we are trying to find Tingana and Sana and Tandi and all the likes that we get down here in Juma sometimes well nature throws different things at you and so we've bumped into a massive herd of elephants that is spread across the landscape at the moment and it's really been a phenomenal kind of last few days as we've had lots of ellies around and that's made bushwalk well highly entertaining and so I'm hoping what we can do is try and just get a little bit of a view of these ellies obviously quite far away at the moment 
moment. So we just bumped into them and they spread out feeding. So there's elephants all over the place. Now the reason we came down this way was to try and see if we could help Brent out with Hosanna as well as to check if there's any signs of Tingana. He often likes to walk down these kind of drainage sections and so we thought it would be a good place to come and have a look. It's going to be obviously very tricky with the rain that fell about 45 minutes ago to find many tracks but you never know what's going to happen. And so this is kind of prime sort of opportunity to well to do an approach on the yellies now marcy what have i heard about tandy and Columba? i haven't heard much to be honest I, I mean i wasn't driving for a few days and it seems as though tandy and Columba have moved off into torchwood which we know that they do from time to time and maybe with the conditions that we've had you know we've had overcast gray wintry kind of feel to it and, and it's been a bit of rain and even wind that's generally prime conditions for our cats to be hunting and so i wouldn't be surprised that tandy managed to grab herself a really substantial meal and that's why her and Columba have stayed on the torchwood side for the kind of most of the the end of the week and into this weekend so that's where i think they are at the moment but no one's actually reported seeing them since we saw her with that diker kill around trias dam area and when she kind of had that interaction with hosana but she's around i'm sure and i'm sure Columbus just fine we know with tandy she can head off into those areas and spend a lot of time that way it's also not a bad place to be looking for her to be honest if she is back on the move this is the kind of extreme of her territory and given that it did rain we should start to see our cats moving about to remark territory so Tingana should be fairly active Tandi would be active Shadulu um, all of the kind of territorial individuals should be moving around and actually marking so where we are now is a great place not only for Ellie's to kind of see on foot but it's also a great place for us to be tracking and to be looking for any signs of our cats right we're going to move off a little bit we're going to try and see if we can get a better view of these Ellie's and check the drainage line where they're feeding and while we do that though let's send you back across to Jamie who's on the lookout for the Inkahuma Pride Well, at least we managed to find a good view of Ellie's. We haven't managed to find our lions yet. And unfortunately, I think I've crossed her beyond our borders. I've just done a quick loop, and I can see some very, very fresh buffalo tracks. Now, that stormy weather, I said that lions don't like it, and they, they don't really. They like to shelter from rain. But if there's an opportunity to hunt, that weather suits them down to the ground because it disorientates their prey and it makes their job slightly easier. Now, this morning, we were with the Inkahumas and they were looking quite full-bellied, but as though they could still eat a little bit more. It was a far cry from their almost entirely flat stomachs two days ago. We managed to find eight Nkuhuma lions, lazing in a shady spot of a dried riverbed, relaxed and resting. They were clearly quite hungry, and the sub-adult cubs displayed some curious behavior, settling into a cub-like suckling position. As darkness fell and the weather worsened, the pride set off through the darkness towards some buffalo, but not before an evening drink. Catching buffalo is thirsty work. So the good news is that they did manage to catch themselves something. We don't know exactly what it was because by the time we found them here this morning, they had already finished it. And all that was left were a few hungry looking hyenas hanging around the outskirts. Now, I found fresh buffalo tracks over here and I think I heard some ox pickers. If I were to guess, I would say that these lions are hidden off somewhere in the bushes. Now, the most interesting thing about that particular sighting was the suckling behavior from it wasn't quite true suckling but the sub adults settling in up against their mom's belly or their aunt's belly potentially and it was very it was fascinating behavior because they really are far past the age where the females would be lactating or where they'd be suckling but obviously old habits are die hard and those instincts are still partially ingrained in their minds Although it would have been completely fruitless to try and suckle, maybe it brought them a little bit of comfort, maybe with the separation, because of course there should be 11 members of the Pride, plus three males. Now this morning there were eight females around here and one of the Mangeni males. I've heard tell after the morning safari that there are still the, the missing members of the Pride are on a giraffe kill with the other Mangeni male and the mystery young male that's joined them. So a bit tricky to keep track of all the things that are happening in the Nkuhuma's lives right now. 
just listening. I was hoping I might sort of hear the sound of buffalo moving through the thick vegetation. Now, Marcel, here's the interesting thing about the Nkuhumas. Those sub-adults are almost at the stage where their mothers are ready to start mating again. So Marcel's wondering how often lions breed. The Nkuhumas will be ready to mate again. The cubs are about two years old. They'll be ready to mate again very, very soon, possibly in the next few months. So with lions, you're looking at a birthing interval of around about every three years if they manage to raise their cubs to adulthood. Obviously, if the cubs are killed for whatever reason, the females will come back into estrus sooner and they will then get pregnant before that three-year interval it really depends in this case three of the five Nkuhuma adult lionesses three of the five yes that's correct three of the five have cubs that are now nearly fully grown actually sub-adults no no luck I'm gonna keep listening Hopefully we get lucky, but unfortunately I think the Inkuhumas have gone beyond where we can follow. While we figure that out, Steve has um, had more success up in the Mara, and he has managed to find a lovely lion pride to spend time with. We are with them, and they're trying again for those wildebeest folks. We're just going to try and get into position. So we can see just ahead of us here is a lioness busy stalking once again. She's hidden behind the rocks. This could be what we've been waiting for the whole afternoon. We were parked here a little while ago and we lost the line somehow on our right hand side. Now I'm just going to stop by this rock. And there she is in front of us there. By the rock there, there's a second youngster joining her. And look at her body language. The second one about to come join her from behind. But while we wait for action to unfold, I'm talking about lions with youngsters, and the Paradise Pride loves the marsh. The Paradise Pride seem content in the marsh area. A swampy field of tall and lush green grass dotted with muddy wallows and small streams. This area is a thoroughfare as it runs along the Mara River and attracts game throughout the year. The Paradise Pride have found the perfect place to rear their cubs. So the bountiful area of the marsh provides beautiful grazing all year round and it's a perfect place if you want to rear cubs with lots of animals moving through. And the marsh pride, the Paradise Pride themselves, my apologies, were eating a wildebeest that day that we found them as is on the menu for all the lions these days. Oh, what happened there? I think she suddenly didn't realize her sister or her daughter was so close behind. I think that might be two youngsters, in fact, in the front. Where are the adults? We don't know. We are keeping our eyes very well peeled because they are not far away at the moment. Look at the intention. Have a look at the body language. There are the wildebeest. Romit, the Paradise Pride being out in the open marsh there, they have quite a nice selection. This time of year, yes, there's lots of wildebeest and zebra moving through, but throughout the year there's topi, impala, uh, all sorts of other small animals such as warthog are moving through, and uh, they quite enjoy whatever is on the cards, in fact. And because there's such abundance of prey, well, there's no need to be too choosy. But this time of year, just with the abundance of wildebeest, they tend to be the number one food on offering. Whether they taste the best or whether it's just the abundance, it seems to, it, it is a debate. But across the African continent in the savannas, due to the abundance of wildebeest, they do form the majority of lion diet in the lion diet. But down in South Africa, well, we see the Nkuhuma pride thoroughly enjoys buffalo when they can. Kuru, Impala and obviously the wildebeest when they're available but their numbers are very low down there they don't have millions of wildebeest as they do up here but the wildebeest are a little bit alerted we don't know what's going to happen this is all coming to you live folks we spent some time with this pride earlier seeing something quite similar to what you're seeing now and unfortunately nothing came about it but where the adults are i think that is the money 
wherever they are. And maybe these youngsters know exactly where they are. Or maybe the adults are watching from a distance to see how these hungry youngsters are going about it because a small pride like this only really needs to feed once a day because there are not too many of them. But anyway, Tristan Dix down in South Africa is hot on the search for Hosanna. We are on the search for cats, but we are surrounded by a massive herd of elephants at the moment. There's Ellie's absolutely everywhere, and so we've just sat still now because, well, there's not really much we can do at the moment. We can't really move off in any directions, so we're just kind of sitting and just enjoying kind of these guys as they slowly start to move around us. We've got an elephant that's off on our right-hand side. There's one straight in the middle, in, straight in front of us that's going to make an appearance fairly shortly. It's coming straight towards where we are. Absolutely phenomenal to be on foot. Seb, you see this one here in front? It's coming right towards us. This is amazing. Now this morning I had an incredible sighting of elephants on foot and it seems as though we we're about to repeat the performance because these elephants are all over the place this afternoon. Really is quite special to be around here. Now of course remember, elephants can be very, very dangerous and you've got to be a bit aware of what you're going to get yourself into when you're around elephants. You've got to always make sure that you're kind of aware of your surroundings and that doesn't apply only for us out here. Our cats also sometimes have to be aware that there's dangers that they face too in their environment. While for the most part life at the top of the leopard hierarchy is a comfortable one for an aging Tingana, there are however still perils he must face to carry on as ruler of this unforgiving land. On a routine territorial patrol, the Duke unknowingly walked straight into one of the Avoca male lines. Luckily, Tingana saw the crouching male lion laying in wait in the nick of time and stopped in his tracks. The moment seemed to last forever as the cats weighed up their options until Tingana decided to make a break for it. Tingana made a clean break and lived to fight another day. Well, wasn't that a close call for the Duke? He really did kind of see that lion at the last minute and luckily that he did because otherwise he would have gotten himself in a little bit of trouble. I think he's also very fortunate that he walked into one of the Avoca males with a limp rather than actually walking in to the Inkuuma pride which would have undoubtedly meant he would have got chased and so he really needs to be quite careful. It's, it's a peril of being out here is that lions are not friends with leopards and so to get that close to a lion and not really see it until the last second could have been very dangerous for him had it been like I say, more than just the one, and had it been a fitter, stronger, healthier line, it definitely would have made life a little bit more tricky for him had it been that case. But an amazing sighting that we managed to witness. It really was super special to be able to kind of see him moving around and just to see how he all of a sudden kind of bumped into that line was really quite something. Now, while our Ellie's close in and get a little closer, it seems like Steve has got his lines and they also are getting a little closer to the prey that they are busy stalking. They are. Watch close to the bottom of the screen. That little black bump. Look underneath it. There we go to the left. They are the ears I was talking about. Now that's how the other lioness follow them. The intention, the body language, points out an individual that that lioness is looking at. And then the rest play their part by seeing what angle are they moving and then try and position themselves in the right spot so as to assist or catch anything that might run in a different direction. Very, very important. That's how lions have evolved on the landscape to be able to take much larger prey than they can individually as working as a unit and they've been waiting for these wildebeest to calm down again and to relax and they're starting to bed down and she's using her cover there's a youngster in the sort of middle right of the screen there the lions will always try and select the easiest trying to bring down a young wildebeest is much easier than an adult that's th probably twice, even three times the weight. So they'll always try and select something and then, well, in the chaos that ensues, if they catch something else, well, they'll take it. Marcel, yes, lions are regarded as a, are threatened at the moment due to um, the fact that they're disappearing in 
places across the African continent due to their sort of, what's the word, their interference in livestock with people and also due to the fact that there is an enormous industry in the East we're talking about tiger bones and tiger bones something in traditional medicine in the east and there's a lot of people that are hunting lions in Africa and then selling their bones off as tiger bones so the market the price is enormous so lions are disappearing at an alarming rate their numbers are going down down every year only in these massive reserves are they still in really good really good nick but let's have another look the second lioness she started moving off to the right she's kind of picked up on her sister's idea she see how she's now looking to the right hand side due to the change in body language now folks bearing in mind lions have got a success rate of probably 20 percent or less when it comes to hunting and these to me appear to both be youngsters so their success rate are even lower kathy i'm not 100 percent sure how close they are i'm gonna have another little look now but i'm reckoning probably less than 50 yards at the moment um, they would like to the one on the left anyway. There's a little bit of a of a bump there She might try and go down that bump and up the other side But it is difficult to actually in this terrain to see exactly how far away they are We thought they were much closer earlier and then when we saw that young line is finally make that run It took her forever to cover that ground and uh, Well by the time she got anywhere near the wildebeest it was well and truly out of reach She's looking back to see if there's any assistance off to the left. There might be another lioness. We don't know where that third one has gotten to. She might have moved around to the left. And these two might be standing where they are due to the fact that one might try and chase them back. It does happen. We've seen it in South Africa with the drone in the air. You get a nice aerial view of the lion hunt. And this is all completely non-verbal communication between the lions. They know exactly what they want to do. And through experience, through mother and daughter and pride dynamics, these sort of traits are passed down. And you see she's looking to the left as if there might be something there. We can't see. But it might be one lying flat in the grass. I've been scanning with my binoculars. Number one tool is a guide. Binoculars and out here in the Mara Plains you need binoculars Heidi they are so camouflaged I mean we came back to the scene where we knew they were and we drove past them that's how camouflaged they are and can you imagine being a wildebeest well there's so many of them I suppose it's quite a common affair out here but their objective is to to keep that distance between the lions and being in a large herd like this the wildebeest think they're safe they always think old Joe or Bob's watching or maybe Sarah's watching but uh, unfortunately when they're in a bigger herd like this they, it's generally hot, easier to catch because that well, there she goes she's making a move on the right hand side the one on the left has disappeared okay well as soon as the action unfolds you'll come right back to us but apparently if Smith is tracking he would like to find a cat for himself Well, I wish I was tracking, Stavovo. One needs tracks to track. We haven't managed to find any just yet. So, I've just done a, a big loop. And I saw the elephant herd that Tristan is with. So we cut further to the west. Maybe Hosanna came up towards this area. But so far, I've just been seeing lots of relaxed impala and uh, that's about it really so I think what we're gonna do is head back towards Vuyatela access maybe they saw Hassan a little bit further away from quarantine from where we left him this morning hmm he's probably just sleeping somewhere close by to camp So it's definitely one of my favorite spots on, on Juma, looking down this valley. Can you see what I've seen in the valley, Dave? I see an elephant, Dave. Uh, to the right slightly. There we go. Looks like a young bull all by himself. Now, it's always good to stop while you're on safari and listen carefully to see if we hear any alarm calls to 
signify the presence of a predator and hopefully the specific predator we're looking for. Hosanna. Okay, let us meander on, keep checking for our little chief. And while we do that, it sounds like Devovo's lions are on the move. Thanks, Brad. Good luck that side. Well, the lioness, the one that was on the left-hand side, folks, has closed the gap by about 20 odd yards, 20 meters. And she's just behind the rock. Now, the wildebeest still have not looked at her. Her sister's moved a meter or two forward and gone flat. But she's trying to figure out where is mum? Like, mum, what do I do now? Last time I got into this position, I failed. Now, give me some help. So there's the other sister. You see, they're looking around questioningly. Look at the camera, man, I suppose, going, are you ready? Are you guys ready? I'm going to go now. <laughs> so she's trying to pick out probably one of the individuals in that small group that are the smaller of the, of the group. And they've all got their backs to them about 20 yards or so. I actually would like to, I'm going to invest in a range finder so that next time I could tell you for sure how far away the lion is from the animals. It's going to go around that way over the rock. Let's have a look. Hello Paula, one lioness could bring down a wildebeest, one lion, male definitely, um, but sometimes if, they, if they're young or inexperienced they might not quite have the sort of uh, judo uh, what's the word, judo sort of flip that enables them to pull them to the ground. There's a technique involved. Uh, they can jump onto them and slam them across by pulling their body because um, the dew claw, which is high up on the wrist of the lion, those will wrap around with the front of the claws being sort of a nice 90 degree angle and they're able to pull an animal off their feet by using their weight and the, putting them off balance. But a big male wildebeest, if a lioness runs at it and jumps just on the bum, it might not be able to pull it down easily. Um, but sometimes by doing that, you can slow it down and enable a second lioness to come in and to be able to grab it by the neck. Because the thing is to jump on a wildebeest, it's got horns on the top of their head. They're able to use those horns to good effect. And well, they could penetrate skin, they could damage an eye, and let's see what she does. I'm keeping the other the younger lioness hasn't moved. It's in the same position. She seems like she's picking out an individual. James Richard, they are completely spoiled for choice. We drive through the landscape on a daily basis and there are vultures picking at bones. I don't know how many wildebeest have been taken, but it doesn't seem to even dent the numbers. Okay, look how she's disappeared now. We just have to keep our eyes peeled on around that rock. This is where patience really comes in. The male lion is eventually decided to get up and join the foray. Monique, I mean, I think that's possible. There's the young female. And the young male is eventually coming up towards the right over here. I don't know where the adults are. They didn't take any um, sort of effort. There's the young male. I didn't take any effort in the initial hunt. But they might be in here somewhere. They might be have gone all the way around and are actually about to push these wildebeest back towards these youngsters who don't quite have the technique of stalking and getting too close. So they're very good at jumping and holding onto things. And there's the boy. Have a look at his back left hip. He's got a very bad wound over there, but his belly is quite full because being a boy, regardless of how old you are, you always eat more than the ladies. Doesn't matter what species you are, I suppose. And he's finally making his way in. That lioness that was stalking in the beginning, she's moved just slightly to the left of the rock now, so she hasn't made another move as this male gets himself into a possible ambush position. There's the lioness over there. She's going to go around now. Maybe she has seen something interesting. Oh, she's obviously going to go over the little hill that we can't see, isn't she, Archie? That's how it works. Oh, she's using the rocks for cover. This is so awesome to watch, folks. Don't forget to send through any questions and comments you might have. I'm 
wonder if you can hear how windy it is. Really does make a big difference in the lion's approach. Okay, well, we're going to move up and see if we can get into a better position for this hunt. And while we do, let's go back down to Tristan and his elephant. Well, good luck, Steve. We, at the moment, unfortunately, are sitting a dead still, and that's because we've got a bull elephant that has sneaked up to us and is, I would say, probably within about 10 meters from where I'm sitting at the moment. The thing is, is that he's feeding his way slowly, but surely closer and closer, and so we're just sitting dead still in the hope that he is going to kind of find his way out of the little drainage line, otherwise he's going to walk right in front of us, which will be quite something, so we can't really move anywhere. The problem is, is we've got another elephant behind us, so <laughs> we kind of stuck in here at the moment, which is... Well, not the worst thing at all. I'm quite enjoying it. But, Peter, you say any time spent with Ellie's is a good time? Indeed, and we have been so spoilt in the last few um, days. We've had epic, epic elephant encounters on foot. It really is thanks to, to Rex, and you know, who obviously gets us into these incredible places time in and time out. And, you know, we've had these most amazing kind of sightings between all of us, you know, Brent and Jamie and Taylor, myself. It's been quite something, but... This afternoon is shaping up to be a beautiful one. There's this little bit of golden light that is just starting to come out from time to time. And it's against the sort of darkness of the LEDs that are still wet from the rain, it is really quite something. So it's turning and shaping to be a magical, magical sighting. We still also, it's a not a bad thing that we're sitting like this because it allows us to be... Um, in a central part of the property where we can hear very, very well. You must remember that with the rain, tracking has become very difficult, but if we're sitting dead still, we can hear noises all around us, and that means that if any of our cats are mobile or moving, we will be able to pick up the noises and pick up the alarm calls if they get seen by, let's say, a bushbuck or an impala or something like that, and be able to then work out where they are. So sometimes being stationary is not the worst thing at all, and, and especially given where we are. We're so central to the kind of whole area that we can pick up anything on either side of us and be able to follow up on it and hopefully have some success. So it really is a good spot that we're in. So, Lulu, sometimes you will find any herds will merge under certain conditions. It's not always only dry seasons, but dry seasons is a time that you do see a lot of Eli herds um, coming around to certain water points, particularly. Oh, bless you. That's what happens when you get some mud up your nose. And so it's just blowing out a little bit of the mud that's kind of collected. It is very muddy. I'm pretty sure when I stand up from here, I'm going to look like I've soiled myself because I'm sitting on the mud and I can feel it slowly seeping, the wetness kind of slowly sleeping in my pants, which is not very pleasant at all. But you can see it is a kind of dark, dark mud, which is going to be quite something when I stand up. So please don't laugh at me when you see me from behind during the course of this afternoon when we're walking around a little bit later. I'm pretty sure you all will anyway. But you can see that this Ellie is still incredibly close and the thing is is where he is now there really isn't any way for him to go up that bank he's going to have to either go the way he came or he's going to follow the bank around and there's a pathway that's just off to my left hand side that runs right here and so that would probably be the pathway that he would have to use or he's going to come along the front where there's a lot of pathways that are, or movement of Ellie's that has taken place and so it's kind of this is the area that he's going to be we're perfectly safe where we are we're on this perfect little termite mound that he won't be able to get up even if he tried to climb up here he wouldn't have any chance and so we just have to sit dead quiet and just kind of enjoy the sort of beauty of being in amongst an elephant herd it really is quite something it was amazing though how quickly we got in amongst them because we kind of saw them in the distance and we walked a little bit and all of a sudden there was just ellies popping out everywhere around us and that can be kind of one of the things about being out in the bush and when you're on foot is that you've got to be a bit careful sometimes that everyone thinks ellies make a lot of noise but sometimes they can be incredibly quiet and they can just pop out kind of right next to you so you always got to be aware of those kind of things Right now, it seems as our Ellie is going to come around a little bit further. And so, while we kind of wait for him, let's see if he's going to come this way. No, he's just going to stop there and feed. So, we're going to see while we kind of wait for him to get here. Let's send you back across to Steve, who's still with the lions and who are still trying to hunt those of the beast.
well, the wildebeest are slowly moving away as they're feeding. And this uh, one young lioness seemingly out of reach at the moment. She's, the distance is getting bigger and bigger by the minute. And the wildebeest slowly feed as they move away. She's in such a good position behind that really big rock. You can see the characteristic cysts on the back of her leg give away her age. So inquisitive. A great time of practicing, in fact. That's maybe why the adults are nowhere to be seen. They're letting them practice. Go, okay, you go catch some food. Oh, here we go. She's going to show us how it's done. She's been waiting for you to waiting for you to come back before she shows us the shows us. Yeah, well, from our stalk, let's go back down to Juma with Jamie, who's got some action. I'm terribly sorry, just as you came across uh, to us all the way from the Mara, the pole of our roof got in the way of the stalk that we were trying to show you. Now, that is because it has been pouring with rain all day, so we put the roof on only for the rain to stop, because that's obviously how one makes it stop raining, is to be prepared for it. So the search for the Inkuhumas uh, continues. It doesn't sound as though any of the other guides have had any luck, so what I thought we would do is we'd come and check the water hole. Since there's nothing here, we're going to continue on around towards the hyena den, but Tristan is sneaking closer and closer to an ellie. We are indeed, look at this. This elephant is right here. He's come right past the mound and he's just walking right next to us. Okay, that is unbelievable. That is as close as you're ever going to get to a wild elephant on foot. Unbelievable. Look at that. Is your eye itchy? No, 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 you're right, quite right. There is nothing like looking to an Ellie's eye, and especially when it's a meter in front of you and staring at the same eye level as you, you are. It's quite something, so... That was very, very, very special. That elephant, he put his trunk out and almost touched this tree that's right here in front of me. So that's how close he actually came. If you look down below, you can see where his foot was, down at the bottom of the base of the mound. And he kind of just walked past. And he's still not 100% sure about where we are or what we're actually doing. He kind of walked past and... Out of the corner of his eye, I think he realized, hang on a second, there's actually somebody sitting right here, but he didn't really understand what it was, and that's why he kind of just pivoted like that and sort of looked at us, and has now gone off round the side, and is still feeding, so that was just unbelievable. It's really very seldom that you're going to get to see something like that. It's seriously quite special to be in the company of these guys. The rest of the Ellies are still coming, so there's a bull and a cow and a calf that are slowly coming through the drainage line at the moment, heading in our direction once again, so it's going to be a little while, unfortunately, until we can move. Well, I say unfortunately, but I've thoroughly enjoyed kind of being up here. We had a really brief view of a little baby as well, trying to play on one of the banks and climb its way up, which was very entertaining just when we saw you guys last time. And so that little one is also around somewhere in this general vicinity. But that was seriously, seriously special. It's one of those kind of once in a sort of lifetime sightings that you're going to get where an Ellie's going to get like that with us. It really is quite something. And it just goes to show that if you're quiet and you sit very, very still and you low down, that Ellie's will walk past. And you can see that Ellie was not aggressive towards us in any way. It didn't try and kind of throw anything at us. It didn't trumpet, it didn't mock charge. It just realized, hang on, something's watching me from this bank. I can't really get to it. It's not being aggressive towards me. And then it just walks off and around. But super, super special to get something like that on foot. It really is one of those incredible moments. Good. Now, we're going to, like I say, we have to sit and be patient. These Ellie's are still all around us. And so while we are patient, let's send you back across to Steve and the Ololololo Pride. Yes, well, this female stood up and, well, what can I say, she was spotted by all angles, wildebeest on the ridge, wildebeest on the plain, all spotted her and all have moved off to what now seems a very out of reach position. But that is sometimes what lions try and do, is cause this kind of confusion, get the herd to run in all different directions, and, well, maybe they will run into 
in the right direction where there is one lioness or two lying up in the right position. Sometimes it's well worked out and sometimes it's just pure luck. But there she is. See if you can spot her. Eyes of wildebeest are very, very good. They're looking for the shape of the lioness. And she stood up and gave that characteristic sort of lion shape with the ears. That's what we look for with the bushwalk. That little look in the grass of a, of a lion lifting its head over the grass. You see the shape of the ears and the head. Oh, where is she going? Maybe she's thinking that the confusion of the herd on the slopes might provide her with an easy meal. So it's a good time for practicing. Okay, well we're going to move up and see if we can catch up with her on the move. And let's go back down to Brent who's still on the search for Little Chief. Well, we are still on the search for a track, a track of any leopard at the moment. Uh, I think maybe they took advantage of that rain and all caught themselves a snack. But um, I'm confident we've still got some time to find some cats. There are plenty of cats around this morning. <laughs> Not this evening so far. But of course we've been really, really lucky having Hasana basically very close to camp and spending a lot of time around quarantine and Gallego. And uh, he's been quite successful in his hunting around the pans, but every now and then Hasana's eyes get too big for his mouth and uh, he has to think twice before attacking. Hosanna was found showing great interest in a large male warthog on the quarantine clearings. He however changed his mind quickly after he got a look at those menacing tusks. Our little chief has quite a bit of growing to do yet before he can take on such a hefty pig. Discretion proved to be the better choice and he moved off to the shade for a cat nap. In time, I'm sure Hosanna is going to become a great pig hunter, but a big male warthog like that, oof, it's a bit too big for him at this age. I think once he's about five, four, five, he should be able to take on those big pigs. Like Tangana and Hukumuri, both love a good warthog. Hello, Deborah. Deborah is wondering how we decide the name of the leopards. So different reserves have different naming protocols. What we do is, uh, generally, we will choose a bunch of names. Uh, normally in Shangan or Sitonga, which is the in local language here, and we will take them to Rexon and Aubrey and Tax and Herbie and we'll have a discussion and then the name that we think is the best is then chosen now and again it depends that's how we do it if the leopards are born on Juma on the neighboring reserves uh, whoever finds the cubs first gets naming rights um, or if they are found by a guide from another lodge but are found on let's say Chitwa for example um, the Chitwa guides will have the naming rights. Quickly across to Tristan. Oh, look at this, guys. The female and the baby and her other young one have come in to this little area as well. And they should do the exact same thing and walk right past us. Now, we're going to keep very quiet as they do. And you guys can listen to the sounds of these dailies coming past. It really is quite spectacular. She might stop for a little feed first, so as she starts to move our way, I will start to keep quiet in order to not disturb her too much, but she should theoretically follow the same path, which will be around the bend and then in front of us, but look at the little one. This is just too epic. Good as it gets. 
gets on a walk. Like I say, we've got a little baby Ellie that's busy trying to learn how to use its trunk. Look how it's trying to pick up the little branches. Isn't that cool? Well, Rachel, yes, I mean, they have got sensory cells in their feet, and even though they're babies, they can still pick up potential danger around them, but their mother will be far more susceptible to it and defend that little one, as well as even the older calf. That older calf will also come to the aid of this little one, and so it's more up to them than it is the baby to detect danger around them. But yes, it does have the sensory ability to pick those up and to be able to do what it needs to do to stay nice and safe. But look at this one digging for roots. Now that early, the sub-adult, if you look along its tummy, you'll notice that there is actually a little abscess that has got on its tummy at the moment. Hello, little one. Look, the little one is sniffing us. What's she doing? Hello. I don't think it knows what to make of us on this mound. Isn't that just the cutest thing? It's absolutely awesome. We're so, so spoiled. Now, yeah, they're going to come around, so I'm going to stay nice and quiet. Looks like Mom maybe have found, has found another root that she wants to actually eat. And so she's just stopped a little bit. The baby will be fairly m mobile. The baby you'll see will move quite a bit, and that's because... It obviously can't feed the same way the adults can, and so it's a little bit more kind of nervous. What are you doing, little one? How cute is that? That is as cute as it gets, and like I say, all of this on foot is very, very, very special. We are being spoiled more than I can even tell you. This has got to rank as probably one of my best elephant on foot experiences that I've ever had and I've been fortunate in that I've had a lot in many parts of Africa. This is seriously one of the most amazing experiences, particularly if that female comes past. So Zephyr, you say, ah, oh, so cute. It is very, very cute. Look at that. Hello, little one. You're very cute. Now, not as wrinkly as one of our other ones that we saw the other day, but... Okay, here comes Mom. Look at her. Isn't she beautiful? Right now, because this is so special, we are going to take this to a wider audience. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to South Africa. As you can see, we've got a herd of elephants, a mom and her baby, that are straight across from us. We're out on a bushwalk, and we've managed to bump into these guys and get the most incredible view of them as they're walking across the bank. It is seriously, seriously special. We are coming to you live, like I said, and that means you can interact with us, so you can you post any questions you have in the comments section below. But there's a little baby that's charging around now. Mom is just making sure little one is safe. There's a bit of a wind that's just started to swirl, so you see now she's picked up our scent and she's just looking in our direction, just making sure that her baby is nice and safe and making sure that it gets away. Well, Mike, we are trying to make friends. Obviously, we've got to be a little bit careful with Ellie's because Ellie's can be seriously, seriously dangerous animals on foot. Um, but luckily what we've got is we've got ourselves into a really nice position where we kind of on a very steep bank where the Ellie's won't be able to get to us. Um, there's a nice bit of space between us and them, and so at this stage everything is okay and we can make friends, but she seems to have relaxed now. She might have caught a bit of a scent and, and then tried to kind of shift her baby off a little bit, but now that she's digging for roots and feeding, that is a sign that she's completely kind of comfortable with what's going on. She wouldn't stop and feed with her baby so close if she was worried. Now, sorry Emma, if you can just repeat that for me. 
So Lisa, she is a big mama. She's not the oldest female that I've seen out here, nor the biggest, but when you are standing less than 10 meters from her, or sitting, should I say, less than 10 meters from her, she is massive, and she certainly has an intimidating presence, and you would not want to cross a mother elephant. There's one thing about Ellie's. They might be intelligent, but they are also highly, highly protective of their little ones. They will do everything that they can in order to try and keep their babies safe, and that often means that they'll front up and be quite kind of aggressive to a threat. Luckily, like I say, for us, we're not a threat in any way. We're not being threatening in our behavior. We're sitting here. We've got our voices quite low. We're making a very low profile by sitting up against a mound and up against a bank where it's not really a profile that she's picking up, and the wind, unfortunately, every now and then swirls because we've had a bit of a storm this afternoon, and that means that it's a bit tricky because she sometimes is picking up our scent more than anything else, but she's relaxed completely now. I mean, look at how she's digging out that root. Isn't that incredible? Now, these kind of sightings generally are kind of reserved for being in a vehicle, but for some reason we've been so spoiled this afternoon by getting as close as we've managed to get, and now we've even got a bit of light breaking through into the sort of bush, and it's really kind of highlighting this Ellie. Now, Liz, you say so lucky, you wish that you could be on foot with us. Well, Liz, we are incredibly lucky to be able to do this it's one of those very fortunate things as being out here as a guide and probably one of my best parts of my job is being able to kind of share this with all of you it really is a magical thing to be on foot with with ellie's and i hope that one day liz wherever you may be that you are get an opportunity to come out and go on a guided experience where you can potentially view ellie's on foot there's very few things like as well there's a little diker in the background behind the ellie there's a little small antelope that's moving around as well so i don't know if it's visible but i just saw it kind of bounce out but I'm hoping the little baby Ellie comes back towards mom it is quite old already it's not suckling by the looks of things anymore well she certainly is not producing vast amounts of milk which means that it's probably spending most of its time trying to actually forage for food now and it's being a bit shy because it's hiding itself behind a sort of fallen over tree but it is the cutest little Ellie ever it really is very very cute we had it just now much closer to us and it was kind of rubbing up on trees and trying to use its trunk and generally just being a baby elephant which typically is a lot of life a lot of energy and an overload of cuteness so Melaine, she is keeping an eye on us she's just aware that there's something opposite her but she doesn't know quite what it is and because we're not threatening she's happy just to feed like that her baby is not too close to us and so she's okay to have you know the little one there and for her to feed in this area and she's just making sure that there's not too much movement across from her that she needs to worry about so at this stage all is okay her general body language is very good like i say an elephant when it's stressed will not eat um, it will be very focused on you, her head would be raised, her ears would be out to make herself more impressive and bigger and you'd find her tail would be dead straight at the moment her tail is relaxed it's just kind of flopping in the breeze every now and then it's lifting because I think she's about to go to the toilet at the moment and then you'll find that her ears are quite relaxed she's flapping them and like I said is still feeding so her behavior for now is absolutely fine she is kind of keeping a close look on what's going on but she's not too stressed about us at all I just wish her little one would come out because like I say it is the cutest thing we've got another Ellie that's actually just come out on the right hand side of us he walked past us a little bit earlier we had a little bull a young bull elephant that was a teenager he walked out and he kind of decided to come say hello and he's just kind of gone down across the river bank there but this has been a phenomenal afternoon with our eddies we really have been fortunate to be this close to eddies on foot is probably got to be one of the biggest highlights of our guiding careers and so very 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 special but it's all we're going to be doing for now hopefully you've enjoyed this and if you want to carry on and see what happens with our eddies while we sit here you can google safari live but until next time from myself and seb it's been an absolute pleasure Right, now, our Ellie's are still digging. They're still straight across from us. This is just the most spectacular sighting, but it sounds like Jamie has caught up with a cuteness overload. That's awesome, Tristan. I'm really, really happy for him. That sounded really, truly magical. Speaking of really, truly magical, we're enjoying watching one of our members of the Juma clan clean the bottom of her cub. Now this is pretty 
and we have while we've long suspected that she has or that she had cubs we have only just in this last week discovered that that is the case and seen her cub for the first time so we are at the Juma clan den they've recently moved here and we have not one but two little cubs there we go there's pretty very easily identifiable and if you're really lucky if you're really really lucky you might even have a chance to see a corky's cub as well with its a tiny little bald patch well, it's been popping its head in and out throughout while we've been sitting here corky isn't here so there's two different cubs from two different mothers and the mother of the younger cub isn't isn't at the den at the moment so while the her cub feels comfortable enough to come out what it's been trying to do is actually suckle from pretty which is very cheeky indeed because hyenas don't allow cubs from other mothers to suckle from them there are very very limited exceptions to that rule and the only time it happens only time it happens is well I'll explain about it later because interesting things are happening in the Mara with Steve let's go and find out what his lions are up to now yes well this lioness has finally given up the chase on that herd of wildebeest but then start running back in the other direction because another herd of wildebeest came down the mountain from the other side um, but her and her two siblings, well, they seem to be left out in the windy cold with no adults anywhere to be seen. And those two started playing. There we go. Oh, <laughs> that's what you get for being a big brother. <laughs> it's all play. It's all fun and games. They were clawing the tree a moment ago. And now you're probably going to see that other youngster get on top on top of the rock as well. Daniel, lions don't generally run more than about 50 odd meters after prey. Uh, maybe less, maybe more. They were going to play on top of the rock. Invariably they want to get as close as they can. Uh, but there are places like in the Kalahari where their lions actually lie out in sort of a relay sort of fashion and, and chase the animals and then as soon as the one lion gets tired the next lion picks up the chase but I mean it all depends on the prey they're chasing all the animals out here invariably over distance are much faster than lions so if they haven't caught them in the first 20 to 30 meters 20 to 30 yards well invariably they give up because there's no chance they're going to catch them they have great acceleration out of the blocks, but once the prey animals are alerted to them and move off, well, there's no real chance of them catching. So you don't really see them going much longer than that. Cheetah are more of a pursuit specialist. They can go up to almost 300 meters, 400 meters even. But then after a chase like that, even if they do catch or if they miss, they're completely out of breath. Hyena, wild dog, well, they are stamina specialists and they can go on all day long. I'm going to get some fun here. There's no food, but we'll play with each other. That was a perfect takedown. I was talking earlier about the wildebeest and how that takedown about the judo slam. And that was a very good example of a judo slam. But anyway, from our playful lions down to Juma with the little hyena pups. Oh, there's so much happening this afternoon, we barely know where to look when. Of course, while you were with Steve and his lions were being entertaining, Corky's cub came out, stuck its head up, and tried once again to suckle from Pretty, only to find itself kicked back into the den. I was talking about aloe suckling because it's a really nice comparison between the lions that we were looking for earlier today, and of course Steve has lions as well in the Mara, and spotted hyenas. Our spotted hyenas, clans are made up of females that are not necessarily related to each other, whereas lion prides will be related, will all be related. So they'll be sisters, aunts, cousins, daughters, mothers, whatever it happens to be. What that means is that when lions have cubs, they will allow the cubs of another female to suckle from them if they are lactating, wherein hyenas, it doesn't actually work that way. 
And the only time you will see a cub suckling from a female is when it is a very, very high-ranked cub that is forcing or bullying a low-ranked female into feeding it. And the low-ranked female only really participates or allows it to happen because she's scared of retaliation from the high-ranked cub's mother. I wish you could see a pretty little cub. It stuck its face up earlier when it was disturbed by a Corky's cub. And it is the wrinkliest, it's got the wrinkliest little face imaginable. It looks like, it looks old. It's all wrinkled and concerned with frown lines. Well, since our hyena cubs have done such a sterling job of hiding away from you every time I want to show them, let's give you a little a taste of what you can expect when they do come out. After moving halfway across Juma to a new den site, Corky's cub was finally out and about and exploring its new home. The cub very quickly overcame its nervousness and after a brief breakfast snack, merrily gambled around and over mum, never straying too far from her side. This little face, with its perfect bald patch, is destined to warm hearts. Heartwarming indeed. And at that point, while we knew that Pretty had a cub somewhere, we didn't realize that we'd have double the cuteness at the same den site. Last time I saw Pretty, now I see, or oh, I had note, I had been informed of this beforehand, she's lost the tip of the top of her left ear. There's her little one. You can just see its little leg tucked up against it. That's its back leg over there. Mom has finished attending to its hygienic needs. Although, hygiene is all relative where hyenas are concerned. Before you came across here, we watched a pretty urinate on its head. Now, everything's relative when you're a hyena or a lion. We've seen them do that to their cubs as well. I think Corky's cub has got the message, though. It hasn't tried to come out again. Rosalind, I'm not sure of the exact numbers of hyenas in this clan. I've been away for a little while, so I haven't had a chance to do a proper head count. But you're probably looking at around about 14 or 15 that I can think of off the top of my head. The Juma clan seemed to suffer a little bit of a setback in the last year or so. The matriarch, madam, disappeared. She hasn't been seen for an extended period of time. And one of the low-ranked females disappeared as well. And in fact, last year was marked, last year and the beginning of this year were marked by the disappearance of several females. And it's only recently that the Juma clan has moved their den site back onto Juma itself, which means we can start to really get an idea of which members of the clan are still alive or still around and their relationship with each other. And does the Juma clan have a new matriarch and who would it be? Pretty, interestingly enough, is Madam's daughter. So, by rights, <coughs> she's one of the highest ranking members of this clan. Her brother, Bella, has probably dispersed. Am I thinking? Yes, I am right. And so, Pretty is one of the highest ranking members. Is she the matriarch? It doesn't seem to be that way. By all accounts, a Corky seems to be more dominant than Pretty. But this is a perfect opportunity to actually watch this play out because they're sharing a den site. Although Corky and Pretty have always had very cordial relations. They have been, they've always been friendly with each other. We've never seen any grief between them. And in fact, when we first got to know them properly, they were sharing a den two years ago. When Pretty had November, and Corky had D1 and D2. Oh, Pretty will hear Corky's approach long before we realize that she's on her way. So we've got to keep watching her body. Oh, look, 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 look. Here comes Little Patches. Not official name. 
That is Corky's cub. Little bit younger than the cub that is suckling from Pretty at the moment. How cute. How utterly adorable is that? You're going to get into trouble. Your mom is not here to protect you. Well, the hyena ranking is not necessarily based on size. It's based on psychology. So this little cub, if it is, if Corky is higher ranked than Pretty at this point, has to learn this from its mother. So she will, by her behavior, teach it where it sits in the ranking system and it will respond to that. <laughs> now, if Pretty were the matriarch, I think she would have gone for that cub properly and chased it away properly. I don't know, we'll have to watch and see how this unfolds. But it looks as though Corky's little one is already learning from mum and knows that it can push its luck. You're going to get kicked back into the hole. You're not careful. It's quite a steep entrance at this particular den site. We watched the cub trying to struggle out. Oh, are you hungry? <laughs> it's a standoff. Corky's cub really pushing its limits here. While we wait to see who wins, the bold cub or the adult female, let's find out how Brent's search for the little chief is treating him. Well, at the moment I'm searching for any leopard. I'm going to make my way back towards camp and hopefully Hasana pops out uh, around quarantine a little later. At the moment we're just taking in the beautiful views and uh, it looks like there might be some more rain on the way later on this evening. You can see the dark brooding skies to the south. But now while I ponder where Hasana might possibly be, let's go have a look at what he's been up to earlier in the week. Hosanna continues to scent mark. With Tingana occupied with the new lady from the north, our little chief is testing the boundaries. All of us are wondering if and when he might start soaring, and will that be the final straw that pushes Tingana to chase the little chief away? But for now, it's amazing just to spend time with the goofy Hosanna as he keeps us entertained with all his silly antics. I, for one, will be sad when he moves off to make his way in the world. He is truly such a special, special cat. And I'm hoping we are spoilt with sightings of Hosanna for many years to come. I know that's unlikely, but hey, we can hope. Uh, we're just gonna sit quietly for a bit longer here, listen to see if we can hear any alarm calls. Can hear some brown-headed parrots walking in the distance. Can you hear hornbills? But none of the alarm calls we're hoping for. Oxpecker flying over. distance. Okay, we're going to keep moving now, see what else we can find. Hopefully Hasana is going to make an appearance before the end of the Safari Lives, but let's go back to the one man with Jamie. Still with our lovely two little cubs, not just one. Oh, oh. <laughs> Pretty finally lost it with the cub, with Corky's cub trying to suckle from her and now both cubs have gone into the hole because her own cub got a fright as well. Oh, look at it. Is that not just the wrinkliest thing you ever did see? <laughs> it looks like an old man. <laughs> okay. Well, 
while the cubs re-emerge in theory if they can manage to get out of the den let's go back to steve whose lions are also feeling playful on a marvelous african evening yes well the geology here doesn't only support the beautiful plains of all on the landscape and it's also a very nice playground for some young lioness who have been running and jumping and oh, here we go watch out it's going to jump off the other side oh caught him caught her should i say there we go they've been running and tackling each other the way they should tackle a wildebeest it's been quite comical to watch the boy however with his injured leg has been staying well out of the action because i think it's just quite painful in fact I don't know exactly what happened to him, but one of these lionesses was up a tree just now. It was right up in the tree. We're going to have to move up quickly to see if we can get them on the other side of that big basalt rock. It just happened to block our view. That is, the colours are a little bit so faded. I have a moment to take up as much light as we can. Oh, so it might look a little bit black and white to you try to use the infrared light to our light has gone our sun is setting in the distance and has been overcast for some time and the light is quite poor on the eye we're going into the realm of darkness with these young lions where are your parents or should I say mum and aunt I don't know they are walking every which direction they can to try and find them they've been climbing trees and rocks and looking off into the distance to see if they can find it but so far they have not been lucky I have no doubt that possibly <laughs> the lioness have maybe killed something when uh, with the other pride not watching Courtney how old are females well females can probably mate from as early as about two two and a half but normally more like around the age of about three is when they're properly into estrus but a little bit earlier can happen uh, the same goes with males but they're not generally allowed to mate earlier than that because they haven't exerted any dominance so three is pretty much about the sort of age and males anywhere from about three up to four is when they start becoming sort of a little bit more sexually active. Uh, obviously, they would be possibly one of the reasons why young males get pushed away from a pride, showing interest in their sisters and their mothers. Obviously, from a from a genetic point of view. Okay, well, as it seems like we might be losing some signal, let's go back down to Juma with Jamie and her favorite animal. The cubs are really, truly, or at least Corky's cub is really, truly out and about now. I've decided what Freddy's cub reminds me of. It reminds me of a raisin. And he's so wrinkly, wrinkly, tiny, and dark in color. <laughs> Corky's cub didn't need a tanning twice there. It's interesting that not a sound's been made. Pretty's not making any low groans of warning. Hyenas technically don't growl, but they make a very similar sound to growling when they're cross. Corky hasn't once responded that way, or, or aggressively, really. She's just kept lifting her head and chasing the cub away, quite gently, for a hyena. cub is comfortable once again. Hey Aiden, who is one of our seven-year-old viewers. Aiden, it's very exciting that you're watching the safari. I hope you think the cubs are as cute as I think they are. Now Aiden would like to know if the mama hyena will play with the cubs. And yes, she will a little bit, but mostly she just kind of tolerates them climbing all over her. So she just lies still and lets them treat her like a jungle gym or a chew toy and basically lets them run riot around her. You know what um, which hyenas actually do play, Aiden, is the young males and the young females that have already left the den. They like to come back and play with the cubs and they teach them all about being an adult hyena and how to wrestle and help to build up the cubs' muscles. And sometimes male hyenas, adult male hyenas that are part of the clan, they like to come and visit the den too. 
and keep the cubs entertained. And by doing that, they actually make friends with the mothers as well. So it works for all the hyenas. That's why we spend so much time at these den sites. It's because they're essentially the social hub of the hyena clan, especially when the higher ranked females have cubs. The other members of the clan often come to pay their respects. In my time spent in the Mara, that was how we started off every evening because we could almost guarantee that we were going to find the high ranked individuals and that all of the night's action would start at the den site itself. It took a moment to gather together to bond, to reassert their dominance. Oh, child of the universe, you want to know if all hyena clans are somewhat distantly related? I suppose, yes, if you go far enough back. But there's no close relationship between, say, the Juma clan and um, a clan in the southern Sabi Sand, or a clan on the western edge of Juma. But between perhaps a hyena clan that is to the north in Manuleti, or perhaps even the Elephant's Plain, Elephant Plains clan, there could potentially be a familial connection there. They might once have come from the same clan that split into, into two. Sometimes females don't appreciate their lot in life if they're low ranked and they sometimes do move off and start their own clan. Often when there's been a death of a matriarch, it creates an unsettled feeling within the clan. That hierarchy may be brutally enforced, but it is also essential to their stability and security. So yes, it's possible that neighboring clans are related to each other and perhaps if you go far enough back you, you would of course find common ancestors to, to all hyenas. Remember of course that a lot of the males actually come from neighboring clans. So some of the males that we see around here that are now part of the Juma clan could easily have immigrated in from other clans, from neighboring clans. They will no longer spend time within their natal clan. They invest their lives in their new clan once they're accepted. And they play an enormous role in helping to defend the clan's territory. A male hyena is a crucial part of a clan life. <coughs> Jacqueline, you want to know how many cubs are typically in a clan? It's a difficult one to answer. It depends on the size of the clan. I mean, it's sort of a little bit like how long is a piece of string. What you will notice is that although hyenas breed all year round, they do tend to have cubs around about the same time. There's usually several sets of cubs at a communal den, and there's usually a peak breeding season, and that will depend upon where they are. So in the Mara, just after the arrival of the wildebeest, um, when there's plenty of food, and here in Juma, we often see young cubs of this age around this time as we go into the wet season, at the end of the dry season, where food is plentiful for the predators. So it's difficult to say what would be a typical number. For this clan, we've seen three sets of cubs, perhaps even four sets of cubs at a communal den before. And a, a, a cub, generally a female, will be, have between one and two cubs. I don't think we've had any females with three cubs. It's very unusual for a hyena mother to successfully um, keep three cubs alive to the point that they actually come out of the den. A truly peaceful scene. She could not look more content. Well, the nice thing, of course, is that once her cub is finished having its drink, it's going to want to come out and play, and we'll be here waiting for when it does. Meanwhile, uh, Tristan uh, continues his stroll through the bush. Let's go see if he can top that elephant sighting. Well, we've extracted out of the early sighting. We left the earlies to go on their way, which was perfect. We got out nice and easily, and there was no issues, and that was absolutely wonderful to have spent the afternoon with them. Now you can see it's starting to get very dark to our south once again. There's some very 
big sort of ominous clouds that are developing. It's been a long time since we've seen clouds like that around the Juma area. So hopefully, promise of rain. Rex was actually telling me that down south in the Kruger around the Malalan area that they actually had a bit of flooding this afternoon as it really poured with rain down there. So let's see how it goes. Maybe we're going to get some. Now we're still trying to find any signs of any of our leopards. We found a track that looks a little bit old, which is not ideal. And so hopefully we'll try and pick up something a little bit fresher as we're moving around. We're just checking some of the drainage sections which would be places where a lot of our leopards probably would have hidden during the course of the rain. But we also are in an area where kind of Umfakazi, Tingana, Hosanna spent that time with that kill. And it's not really only been new males that have arrived here in Juma. Well, we've had a few of the females that we don't know arrive to. The dynamics of Juma's leopardesses has been one of ups and downs over the last few years. But just as things seem to be settling, a new shy female from the north has made an appearance for the second time in the last month. Her unrelaxed demeanour suggests her past is one of very little exposure to vehicles and life around as humans. With a bit of patience and quiet, her fear gave way to the overwhelming drive to continue her legacy as she emerged from the thickets to mate with the Duke. The pair spent the day repeatedly mating slowly pushing deeper into Juma and Tundi's territory. Her desperation to mate far outweighed her normal respect of her territorial boundary with her neighbour. After a second round of mating in as many weeks, one can only wonder if successful will this female push deeper and keep her cubs close to their father's domain. Well, isn't that exciting that there is this shy female around? I really hope that we can spend more and more time with her over the next couple months and try and just kind of get her a little bit more relaxed around vehicles. She is definitely very, very nervous. She's obviously come from an area where vehicles were not a huge part of her sort of previous life and hasn't had much exposure to cars and kind of the movement and, and those kind of things and it really took a long time for her to start to kind of feel as though she could come out but she was absolutely beautiful I thoroughly enjoyed spending time with her she's not a leopard that um, we are, I had seen before so it's always wonderful to see a new leopard and she's beautiful in that she's very different to our leopards that we see regularly here. The Karula lineage tends to have quite gold coats whereas if you looked at her she had this very light almost translucent kind of sides to her. She was very pretty and then her kind of face had very expressive eyes. You could see she kind of stare you down a little bit and she's definitely much older than I think we first gave her credit for. You know when she was first seen with Taylor mating with Tingana two weeks ago everyone kind of thought she was a younger female maybe four three four years old but I think she's a bit older than that if you look at the kind of condition of her face and her ears there's definite scarring um, obviously on the mouth she's got that scar over the right sort of part of her mouth and then that little V out of her left ear there's a bit of tattering on the ears and that would indicate that this animal is a little bit older and has actually gone through life quite a bit and so I would say that for me she looks probably closer towards sort of six years old five six maybe even seven which would be interesting I mean it means that she's hung around for this long without anyone really kind of knowing who exactly she is which is kind of incredible to me that in an area with so populated with tourism and with vehicles and people that drive around day in day out that they can still exist a creature like a leopard that can be that kind of elusive and that sort of well hidden and camouflaged that she doesn't get found very often I think it's absolutely amazing and so Awesome to kind of see her mating with Tingana as well. Um, obviously, it's great that Tingana now potentially could father another generation. He's been so successful as a male leopard that it just bodes well for him to kind of carry on. And we'll see what kind of this all means for the rest of the lineages and this sort of dynamic within our leopards here. Anyway, we're going to keep going. We're going to try and see maybe we can get a last-minute leopard. In the meantime, though, let's send you back across to Steve, who I think is still with the lions, and hopefully they'll carry on their hunting. Well, folks, jump on board. I apologize. I thought I'd mention the pride we were with was the Awinos. I definitely did earlier in the unscheduled broadcast. I apologize if I didn't mention it again. The five, pride of five, and we're following these three hyena that have come past the pride at a rate of knots. Unfortunately, we were in a very bad signal area there, so we weren't be able to contribute. So these hyena came along, and they were absolutely motoring. 
Wow, here they are. They we're doing a bit of scent marking. Haven't done any calling that I can, I can tell, but um, they're smelling their noses to the ground, their tails. Well, that one's not, his tail's not up, but the other two have got their tails curled up over their back. And well, this could be exciting. Something could be unfolding. We don't know what they've smelt or what they can hear. But when hyena move like this with excitement, their tails up, something is afoot. Whether they're hunting, whether they are going to steal food from someone, or whether they are other hyena in the area that they're going to compete with, it's hard to say. Child of the universe is a great question. I think lions, regardless of pride size, learn very similar sort of times. Um, the larger the pride, the, the more food is required, so the adults spend more time hunting. Um, smaller prides, maybe the youngsters get more opportunity to assist, but I wouldn't say that at any stage, prides larger or smaller, the youngsters would learn earlier than other prides. They, they put in the effort when the time is right. And well, these hyena, look how excited they are. That herd of wildebeest that the lions were chasing seems to be the attention. But there's stuff on the ground that they keep smelling. Wildebeest are moving at rates of knots. This is epic. We're going to see if we can keep up with those hyena as they move off into the distance. Jump on board. Bumpy. The herd is massing, a huge group of them coming down from the mountain here. Sorry, I didn't quite copy that, M. Judy asked a question about something about dangerous. I'd love to answer. Judy, I don't think the boulders and rocks are very dangerous, in fact. Um, if anything, they provide them with a little bit of, of something to elevate on so that they can see in the distance. From a dangerous point of view, nothing really. They're not moving. I'm just being very careful here. There might be a big hole in the ground. Wildebeest are being... They are spitting up. They are in every single direction at the moment. I don't know what has got under their nose. Have a look at this coming off over to the right. But while we keep up, if we can find these hyena again, let's go back down to Jamie. It seems like her little puppies or cubs are coming out the hole. Just one cub at the moment who briefly stopped suckling to have a look at us. And with that natural curious gaze of a, of a growing hyena cub, just can't quite seem to get comfortable. There we go. About a week and a half, I would say, older than Corky's cub. Look at that face. <laughs> so wrinkly. So, oh, oh. Still a little wobbly. It'll be interesting to see how soon these cubs learn to come up to our vehicle. Because, of course, they haven't got any older cubs to learn from, and that's how... That's how it all starts, as the older cubs teach the younger cubs to make their way towards us. David, no, I haven't had a chance to properly check whether we've got male or female cubs here. It's a tricky thing with young cubs especially. That's why the researchers themselves will never go off just one quick assumption as to whether or not a cub is a male or a female. They have to independently, three of them, have to see the cub's genitals properly and come to a conclusion, an agreement, as to whether or not it is a male or a female. And even then, it's still possible to get it wrong. It is something very, very tricky with hyena cubs, because, of course, female genitalia look very similar to males. This cub's reached the oversized ear stage. Yes, that's your mum's ear. It's the perfect chew toy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you don't need to be scared of us. Barbara, you want to know if new males in the area will pose a threat to hyena cubs? 
Male, in, male infanticide, in other words, males are killing young cubs, is very, very rare in hyenas because of the dominance of females over males. Even a male that has made its way into the, the clan's territory in the hopes of joining the clan will not be brave enough to approach a den and pose a risk to the cubs. The biggest risk to cubs at this age is other adult females, particularly for low-ranked cubs, where there are high-ranked females with cubs at the same den. So sometimes high-ranked females lose their temper with low-ranked cubs if they get a little bit too boisterous with their own cubs and they will turn around and grab the little cub and the low-ranked mothers can't do much about it. They cannot really challenge them. So that is a sad reality of hyena nature. Not all females do it, though. Yes, indeed, Minamu. Hyenas are one of those rare mammal species where they are born with a fully eru or ma rare mammal predators that are born with a fully erupted teeth. <laughs> I'm exploring. Always back to the safety of mum. Not quite old enough to be too brave yet. So what that means is that when two cubs are born to the same litter, they have established their hierarchy before they even emerge properly from the den. They fight with each other. They often come out a little scarred and scratched, especially when you've got two members of the same sex. So if you've got two females in a den or two males, they will fight fiercely to establish that dominance before they even pop out. Oopsie! There is, there was a very common, uh, very common story that um, siblicide was common in hyena cubs, that they would often kill members, if you had two females or two males, one would always kill the other in a display of dominance. That's not true, it does happen, but it is very rare. Uh, so siblicide theory has long been disproved. So it's not typical. All that will happen is that the hierarchy is established. Oh, and we're still thirsty. Or hungry, I should say. Mum's milk is some of the most nutritious milk of any of the mammal species. Oh, come on, it's a raisin. Or a prune. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Very coordinated. <laughs> Play with me, Mum. Play. Play. Play with me. I'm full of energy. I've just had the best meal ever. Oh. Look, 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 Mum. Look, I'm running. I'm running. I'm bouncing. Lily. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Lily. <laughs> Ouch. Did you get a bit carried away there by any chance? <laughs> Fell over and immediately ran to the safety of the den. Lily, who is one of our regular viewers, Lily is seven years old and would like to know when hyena cubs will get their colours. And the answer to that, Lily, is around about two and a half months to three months old, you'll start to see the spots clearly on the shoulders. Then as they get older, the spots become clearer and clearer until all that's left is little dark feet. <laughs> this hyena cub is giving us a, a lesson in, in the grace and agility of hyenas. Are you slipping? This is a very steep den. This is a positively palatial den that they're at termite mound with very steep sides. Aiden, I would love for you to hear the sounds that the cubs make because yes indeed they do make a noise. They make a sound known as a squittering. Now squittering is a sound that they make when they're begging for food and it sounds like they it sounds like a baby dinosaur out of Jurassic Park. That's what it sounds like. It's a ridiculous sound. It's a screeching 
grating and incredibly loud. You can't even believe that a cub that small could make that much noise. So they have proper tantrums when they want food. They will also whoop. So already at this age, they'll start to imitate adult behavior. And it's so sweet because their voices aren't adult voices yet. They've still got little baby voices. And you know how hyenas make that ooh contact call. I don't want to do it too loudly and frighten the cub. But when they're little like this, they go ooh, ooh, ooh. It's very sweet to hear. Hopefully the more time we spend with them, they'll actually show us that. They'll give us a demonstration. If I remember correctly, Pretty's Cub November used to love doing that. Heidi, funnily enough, we do actually know where the rest of the clan, or at least some of the clan members were this morning. They were hanging out around the lions all the way to the east of Juma. We had Ribbon, we had Ribbon's daughter and Tima. Uh, there were a couple of Heidi. <laughs> What's the word again for the, the skin on the elbow? I can't remember now. That's what the cub's trying to chew on pretty. <laughs> Big yawn. I can't think now. <laughs> but it makes the perfect chew toy for a hyena cub. But hyenas, uh, hyenas in a clan don't necessarily all stay together in one big group. So although the clan will unite to chase lions or for kill or to chase away rival clans, they don't, they don't stay together all day. So it's not like a lion pride. They'll hang out together in groups of two or three or maybe five. And they'll go to sleep in thick drainage lines or underneath bushes. But around about now, this would be the perfect time for them to be up and about and active. And I wouldn't be surprised if before the end of <laughs> Safari Lives, ouch, Corky comes back to feed her cub as well. You are horrible. You are so horrible. Vegas cat lover, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for that reminder. The skin of the elbow is called a weenus. I'll say no more because that is what the cub is trying to chew. <laughs> I've watched you fall over your mom's foot at least five times while we've been sitting here. How have you keep forgetting that, mom, that your mom's foot is there? <laughs> now the only time you'll get to see this behavior is when one of the, <laughs> one of the female, <laughs> very difficult to focus on on making coherent conversation about this when you've got cubs doing 360 degree spins supernova hyenas do not make their own dens they will actually oh or did the thunder scare you oh shame is that scary weather rumble rumble <laughs> they will take over old art fark burrows or, or old warthog burrows, but the little cubs will also do a bit of excavating themselves. So you'll see they've got quite sharp little claws, and they use those and to dig their way into little narrower tunnels to help to keep them safe, because the entrance to the den is quite wide, but it's important that they have tunnels they can go into that will help to hide them away from large animals that could be a threat, including other female hyenas. It's also how they end up with bald patches. One of the big reasons they end up with bald <laughs> patches. Are we up, pretty? Mom, don't leave, Mom. Minamu, yes indeed, hyenas will hunt at night or during the day. Most often at night, because the darkness suits them, creates panic, panic, panic and pandemonium with prey species. Oh, so it's scary now. I'm going away. Oh dear. Instinct immediately tells it, back into the safety of the den. 
but hyenas do hunt during the day, most often when it rains. Because that, again, creates a situation where the prey finds it very slippery, very disorienting, and they can use their stamina to chase down and exhaust the animals that they're trying to hunt. So remember for our new viewers, hyenas are not scavengers, spotted hyenas are not scavengers. Brown hyenas, yes, striped hyenas, yes, but spotted hyenas are predators and they mostly will catch, hunt and catch their own food. It's getting a proper bath from mum. Despite desperate efforts to move down further into the den away from her tongue. As the cute family scene unfolds, I think there's a good chance that Pretty's going to vanish off, which is what Hassana has done to Brent this afternoon. Let's see where he is and if he's had any further luck with his search. Well, we're in Hassana's zone, so to speak. And I was hoping for the bark of an Inyala or a bushback or the snort of an Impala. But alas, the little chief has evaded me today. But as we know, last minute leopards happen from time to time. So we're going to head towards Gallagher and his favourite spot. Fingers crossed that we do get a last minute sighting of our wonderful little chief. I'm sure he's around here somewhere. But it has been a, a really great week of catching up with Asana, particularly for me. Obviously, I haven't spent much time with him this year. So I've, I've had a thoroughly wonderful time getting reacquainted with the little sausage. Well, not so little sausage anymore. Now, we still haven't seen any sign of Tandi and Tlalamba yet, so I haven't caught up with them just yet. But I'm going to go park on the edge, get my ears out and open and listening. Hopefully that last minute leopard will happen. In the meantime, I know Tristan is nearly back at camp as the sun is starting to set. We are sort of trying to mobilize quite quickly back home because the thunder is looming very close and there's some ominous clouds kind of coming in our direction. It's a beautiful, beautiful sky, make no mistake, but don't really want to get caught out in a massive thunderstorm on foot. So we're trying to head our way back. It's also starting to get very dark now and it's not obviously a place you want to walk around in the dark. And so we're trying to kind of get that way. We're also still trying to look out for any signs of Hosanna. We're kind of moving about in the areas that he likes to walk in the hope that we might find him somewhere here. Unfortunately though, I don't see any sign of him. I mean, we, we found some tracks that were Rex and I think it could be him. Um, they are damaged by rain, which would mean that he walked there before the rain kind of started heavily, but are on top of some of the early tracks that, of the herd that we saw. So I think it's him kind of, it looked like a heading towards sort of Treehouse Dam. That's roughly where it's kind of looked like it was going, but tough to say. Anyway, we're going to try and kind of head back home. It's that time anyway. And so while we do that, let's send you back across to Jamie and that precious little cub. It's definitely going to be dark soon, which means for human beings like Tristan, it is almost certainly a time to get closer to home. For our hyenas, it means time to wake up and head about their evening business. As almost totally nocturnal creatures, this is when they are at their most awake. We have been treated to a truly stunning evening with a pretty and her little cub and a brief view of Corky's little one as well. This cub is now, Pretty's cub is now doing its utmost to trip mom up. It comes dashing out of the den, bites her ankles or her wrists and then runs back in again. It's an absolute little terror. A tiny raisin with very sharp teeth. A terrifying prospect. A lovely prospect is the knowledge that over the coming weeks and months, that's the joy of safari lives, is that we actually get to track the progress of these little ones as they grow up, get bolder, 
and start to explore the world around them. This has been truly spectacular. So as a pretty attempts to manhandle or hyena handle her cub, that brings us to the end of this episode of Safari Lives. It's been an absolute pleasure catching you up of the going ons of our animals. We'll see you next week and of course tomorrow for the regular show. Bye everyone. <laughs>